Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. The parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, uh, Val. Right, now, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, This morning, um, I'm keeping extra distance from you lot, okay? It's not that I don't love you, I do. But uh, my lovely wife, Adele, you probably noticed, is not here. She's not here because she's self-isolating at home at the minute, all right? Because she's got a positive COVID test. Now, I'm doing a COVID test every day because of that. I'm negative. I have been all week. I am this morning. So be reassured. But because of that, I will not be coming and joining you for coffee after the service. It's not because I don't love you. Because I do. I want to hang out with you. But I don't want to give you anything that may have escaped the testing. All right? So I'm staying up here. And when it comes to communion, I don't want to touch it. All right? Just because we want to be super safe, don't we? I want you, you folks to feel like I can come to church uh, with a degree of reassurance. So, is there anything actually under that cloth? It, it is there, is it? It just looks like there's nothing there, isn't it? <laughs> At the appropriate moment, if I'll ask you to uncover it, we're going to do communion. It's given us an opportunity this, to do communion in a slightly different way, which I've done previously in other churches. And if I explain it now, then hopefully you'll remember it. When we get to the communion, I will do the prayer of consecration as per usual, okay? And I will invite you forward. But no steward will come to the end of your row or anything like that, and it won't be the usual form and orderly cue thing and me dishing it out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go with the rest of the musicians, and we're going we're to sing a song. Well, we're all going to sing a song. And it's a case of when you are ready, prayerfully, Step forward from any part of the room, help yourself to the morsel of bread, then help yourself to the morsel of wine, drink it there, put it back in the tray, return to your seat. Don't all come up at once, because again, we are trying to be fairly responsible about how in the space that we leave between one another, but just gradually, gradually, come up when you feel ready, when there is space at the table, receive the sacrament. And I hope you find this way of doing it. We won't do it every, every week like this. Um, but I hope you'll find it as rewarding as many people in the past have. That as we sing, as we worship God, in the midst of that worship, you can step up in your own time and receive the sacrament. Okay? So that's for this week, just to be super safe. Now, I've got a few other notices, and then I'm going to go into this morning's message. So, um, Rob, would you like to switch the recording on at this point, if you haven't already? Is it on already? Oh, so they've heard that bit about my missus having COVID then. Oh, no. <laughs> I was trying to keep that quiet. No, it doesn't matter, does it? Ironically, she's meant to be starting work this week, so her, fir- uh, her week of COVID is her first week of work, and so her first week of work is a week off sick. <laughs> Hey-ho. Such is the way of it. Right, uh, here's a few notices, and these are important. It's important they make it up onto our church website because other churches in our circuit are going to be accessing our website more and more. Okay? The reason for this is we had a circuit leadership team meeting 
um, on Friday. If you don't know what the circuit leadership team meeting is, it's the circuit stewards, it's representatives from all parts of the West Cornwall circuit. We meet together, we talk about stuff that's going on in various churches and the circuit as a whole. And we, have, we acknowledge, and you're probably aware of it already, but if you're not, we have got a distinct shortage of local preachers in our circuit. And that stupid blooming ruling from the Methodist Church about same-sex marriages has effectively seen off some of our local preachers who would normally be working. Uh, you know, I mean, I've tried my best to say, actually, nothing's going to change in our churches. We're not going to be conducting same-sex marriages in our churches in this circuit. But nevertheless, some of them can't carry on with a clear conscience, blah de blah That's left us a bit of a hole in our preaching. And it means that if you look on the circuit plan for this current quarter, if you're one of those people that looks at the circuit plan, like I know Tony does, because he always tells me when I'm next preaching here, you know, and when I'm next preaching everywhere, in fact, like I don't know. Cheers, Tony. All right. But if you look at that, you'll see that in some churches, and ours is one of them, every now and again, we, it says OA instead of the name of the preacher. That means own arrangement. And unfortunately, because we've got a shortage of preachers in our circuit, there are more and more OA services popping up in churches around the circuit. Now, I know you see me pretty much every week in this service. And I want you to understand just how significant me committing to you every week is. Because all the other churches, including those that are not in my section, are saying, when are we going to see the superintendent? And I'm like, well, you're not. And they go, well, that doesn't seem fair to us. And I'm like, well, it's really important that I'm at Chapel Street at 10.45, as many Sundays as I can be, because we want to centralise our teaching. This is how we're going to get through this situation. And what we've decided to do at the circuit leadership team meeting is to make our audio recording of the weekly message here at Chapel Street available to every church in the circuit. What that means potentially for those who choose to make use of it is that if they don't have a preacher on Sunday, what they can do is they can meet together, they can sing their own hymns, they can pray their own prayers, but then for the main message they have the option to run this audio from our Chapel Street service and share in the message that has been proclaimed in this church. That might sound not as great as having somebody there in person, and that's, that's very true, but what it does do is it gives us an opportunity to centralise our teaching so that we can be doing all the same stuff, all the same time, in lots of different places in the circuit. And some of our tiny churches that have got half a dozen members and such like, this is going to be a lifeline. We are hoping later, well, as soon as we can, but these things always take forever. But our plan, which you probably know, is to start live streaming our services from here at Chapel Street every Sunday so that churches around the circuit, if they don't have a preacher that Sunday, they could put a screen up, have a projector, as some of them already do, and they can actually watch us they actually have the privilege of seeing their superintendent minister. What are? Who could ask for more? As well as hearing him. Uh, some of them may choose just to stick with hearing him. That's plenty, thank you very much. But this is where we're going, and I need you all to know. And I hope this meets with your approval, because, I mean, you guys are a pretty major beneficiary in this. I'm saying this, you're probably like, well, I wish you'd clear off, actually, and let a few local preachers step. Well, it's not going to happen, is it? But the other reason for this is we are going to be starting to do themed preaching. Themed preaching is one of my favourite things because it takes us on a journey. So this, the, the first in our series of theme preaching starts not next Sunday because I'm actually not here next Sunday, all right? Mm-hmm. The Sunday after, January the 23rd, we will be commencing a five-week series of theme preaching in the 1045 service, which will be audio recorded, put on our website for anyone to join in with. And we'll be talking about personal evangelism from Jan 23rd for five weeks, five consecutive Sundays. If you are in a home group, which I know some of you are, and if you meet weekly, you have the opportunity, it's not compulsory, but you have the opportunity if you wish to do your weekly home group Bible study using notes that I've prepared to accompany the Sunday preaching. So from week commencing Sunday, January the 23rd, if you're in a home group, if you would like to share in this, 
the notes will be available. They'll be available, hopefully, as a download from the website. They'll also be available paper copies from here or by emailing me. I will send you them. You can have them just for the leader or for every member of your home group, and we can all do this together. All right? I hope that's... Does that sound all right? Good. That's just a beginning, because when we get to the end of that, I think we've got one or two weeks before the beginning of March, and the, the beginning of March will be Lent. And we will then embark on a five or even six week course of theme preaching as a Lent course, which will have uh, sort of theme preaching every week, every Sunday in the 1045, audio recorded for other churches, for home groups, for anybody who wants to join in to share with us. Further details to be produced. So we are really going on a journey together. And when you come to church on a Sunday morning, it's not a case of, oh, what's he going to be talking about this week? It'll be something random. Next week, it'll be something different that's nothing to do with this week. Oh, no, my friends. In, in actual fact, if you, if you don't come to church one Sunday, you will miss out. That's quite deliberate, of course, because we want nothing better, providing you're available and it doesn't affect your work patterns or whatever, we really love you all to be here because if we're all here, we all get to know one another, we can all build each other up. Coming to church and giving God that Sunday morning every week, putting Jesus at the centre of our lives, so important, so crucial, so central. I happen to believe, because I'm an evangelical Christian, that every member of a church should be, ideally, in a home group as well. We don't have enough home groups currently for every member of our church. If you were sitting, listening to this, thinking, I've got a home, I could lead a home group. Maybe you've done it before, back in in previous years. Why not start it up again or start a new one and either advertise it in our notices to say, starting a new home group, would people like to come? Or if you prefer... Just go around and invite people, people that you know. I mean, this is it. If you have a home group, it, do, it does help if you socially gel well, doesn't it? Yeah? If you just go completely random, it might not work quite so well. Sometimes people say, well, it's best if I actually invite people to my home. People I know, people I hang out with anyway. People who I, know I would you know, normally socialise with anyway. But why not become part of a home group? You don't have to do it by January the 23rd. This is kind of an intro into it. Check out the theme preaching, seeing if you're liking it, seeing if you're getting involved in this. And if you are, why not take it further? Sometimes when I do theme preaching, people email me or ring me during the week and they say, I don't quite understand, Ralph, what you said about such and such a thing. Because we do start going quite deep. Yeah, this is proper meat and veg stuff. Yeah, it's not all, not all d'oeuvres. And people say, I didn't quite understand that bit, Ralph. If you're in a home group, you have the opportunity to discuss it with your friends and talk about it and understand it better. And you get that fellowship as well. Right, so I've banged on enough about that for now. Uh, But it's exciting times. Next thing, on a personal note, it was really nice for us to have our Christmas break and I wasn't here last Sunday because I was on annual leave. And when we got back from Jersey from visiting our daughter and our grandchildren, on our doormat were three New Year's cards from you. Three! And you'd all signed them, one or other of them. And me and Adele have never had a New Year's Eve card before from a church. Ever. What a joy to get home and find these cards, which you'd all signed and put lovely messages in, wishing us a happy New Year. We, we feel so... <laughs> getting emotional again now. We feel so loved and welcomed by what you've done there. Really, really grateful. What a pleasure and a privilege it is to be here and to be amongst you this morning. And I speak for Adele, who would love to be here to thank you personally, but thank you so much for that. And we will work together with you to love you, to fellowship with you, and to grow this place, yeah? So I, d- I didn't want to just let it go. Right, next Sunday, there's a lot of, lot of it's New Year, lots of messages. All right, next Sunday, I won't be here in the morning. There will be the 1045 service and the 915 service as usual. Okay, do come, do share, do fellowship. But it's our Covenant Sunday. And that means, because this is our custom here, that we have one Covenant service for the MAP, the uh, Penzance Churches. What, what does a MAP stand for? Methodist? Around Penzance. Okay, Methodists around Penzance. That will be at 2.30 next Sunday at High Street. 
in Penzance, all right? Smaller church than this one. Do come to that, is what I'm saying. It's, it's funny, it's different for me to have like one covenant service for a number of churches because I think it's such an important service once a year to come to, to start your year with God. But do come if you can. And if, you, if you're not in the habit of coming to a covenant service, why not come to this one? Let's pack the place out up at High Street, which will encourage them and encourage us as we make that massive prayer covenant prayer to God if you've never made the covenant prayer before and you don't know the words I'm not going to run through it now what I would do is direct you to the Methodist website which you can find easily enough you can google it and it's there you can read it in fact you don't even have to go there if you just googled Methodist covenant prayer the text will come up it's a proper prayer Uh, 30 years ago when I first went to a Methodist church, I'd been going for a few weeks to this Methodist church. I was getting to know them. They were really lovely people. I felt like I was going to stay. I was becoming a Christian. And I happened to go to a covenant service. It was just one Sunday. Didn't know what it was. Walked in. There was this prayer we all had to read. And the words of it hit me like a, a mallet between the eyes. It really is. Boom. It's like, are you up for this? Are you coming? Are you coming on the journey? Are you following Jesus? I am no longer my own, but yours is the first line. That's the first line. Put me to what you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me have plenty. Let me have nothing. I'm just going to follow you, Lord, and trust you. It's a big prayer. Some people don't come to the covenant service deliberately because they don't feel strong enough to make the prayer. I respect that. If you feel you can't, you don't want to, you can't commit to Jesus, don't come. Well, do come, but just don't say the prayer. Keep your mask on, nobody will know. All right? Another good reason for coming to the Covenant Service next week is that at High Street, and I don't quite know how this has happened, it's, it's fantastic, we will be welcoming five new members at High Street. That's just at High Street. Two of them will be giving testimony. It will be worth hearing their testimony. Trust me. So do come along if you possibly can. But don't forget to come here in the morning as well. Have a double dose of church. Won't hurt you, will it? It's like a booster jab. Ain't going to hurt you. Final notice, blimey. Uh, Final notice. At the end of this service, if you are on the church council, would you please, well, you can nip out, get your coffee, come back in. We have a very, very quick vote to take. I'll tell you what it's about. We want to appoint a bookkeeper for our church. Uh, Paul Simons is here to tell us who it is, what it, what it entails. We need to vote on it so that we can appoint them. It won't take more than a few minutes. I won't come anywhere near you. I'll stay here. All right? But at the end of the service, let's do that. And can I just say, new year, new start. If you're here and you're saying, I want to I wanna do something for God this year. I, w- I want to step up a bit more than I have. You know, I stopped doing things when COVID started, lockdown started, but now I'm ready. I want to do something. Can I tell you, as, as like a starting point, the very least you could do for your church here at Chapel Street is to become a member of the church council. If you're a church, if you're a church member here at Chapel Street, we need you on the church council. We've got a tiny church council here. It should be bigger. It should be more representative. Be a part of the decision-making process. We only meet four times a year, no more than that. So it's not a great commitment, is it? If you were a member here and you would like to be on the church council, don't come up and talk to me about it afterwards because I don't want to give you anything. But do get in touch and let me know if you would like to do that and we will appoint you. I went to Mousel's church. I'm superintendent. I have to go to all these blooming church councils. I have to do tons of them. And I went to Mousel's church council and there was twice as many people on the church council at Mousel than there is here. We need to fix that, okay? So get involved. Right, now let's talk about Jesus, finally. I think we have been talking about Jesus, ultimately. I could just leave it there, couldn't I? But no, we want to talk about this passage that we had read to us in Luke 15. And I'm just turning it up. It's an interesting one, this. There are two parables. The parable of the lost sheep followed immediately by the parable of the lost coin. Followed immediately, though we didn't read it because it would have made the reading over long, by the parable of the prodigal son. What's going on? First of all, 
The context is always very important, and the context of the beginning of Luke chapter 15 is that Jesus is sitting, eating his own fellowship with some people, and he's not bothered who they are. So he's not like gone to a private club and sat down with the members of that club and having food with them. He's sitting down with anybody who wants to come and share food with him. And when you share food with somebody in that culture, uh, first century Jewish culture, it very much is saying, I welcome you. It very much is saying, I want to be part of you, I want to identify with you, I want to welcome you. There was, was added significance. And of course the religious people, I hate that word, religious, I'm not a religious man, I hope you're not religious either, if you don't know what I'm talking about, we are religious aren't we? No, religion is a pain, religion is people making rules and dressing funny and poncing around being proud. Faith is about welcoming and accepting and loving. The religious people, the Pharisees, the rule makers, they were there and it says straight away, they um, The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were muttering, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. He'll eat with anyone. He should just be sticking with us. Do you know, I've come across Methodist churches like this, none in this circuit, I hasten to add, where they kind of had this mentality. Their theology was a bit like Noah's Ark. I might have touched on this uh, last year. And the idea is, here we are at Chapel Street, and we're the holy ones. Right? And we're all gathered together in like this Noah's Ark and the storms of life and the, all the, the pagans and the heathens are all outside. Yeah? And we're all sheltered in away from the mere. Yeah? And we're going to be saved because we're in here. But we don't want to go out there and we don't want to be talking to them people because they're sinners and they'll drag us down. I've known churches like this. And it's, it's not a good theology. It's not a good way of thinking. We're the holy ones. People say to me, they say, uh, oh, you lot at church, or oh, you're, the, you're the ones who think you're holier than thou, you think, you think you're better than the rest. And I always say, no, we don't. We, we realise that we're sinners. We realise that we're sick. This is like a doctor's waiting room. I know I've said this before, but I'm fond of this analogy. This is like a doctor's waiting room. We're all ill, and we're all here to see the doctor. The doctor is Jesus. Jesus has the healing. That's why we're here. If we didn't think we needed healing, we wouldn't bother coming, but we do. We need healing through prayer. We need healing through the sacrament. We need healing through the worship. That's why I'm encouraging you to sing freely and lift your voices and lift your hands as time goes on. I'd love to see a bit of that, yeah? Speaking in tongues, I'd love to see that, but that may be some way down the road for some of you, all right? But it's whatever you feel comfortable doing. We know we've got issues, and we've come to sort them out. We desire to walk more closely with God. We don't think we're better than we are. The Pharisees did, you see. So, oh, Jesus sitting down with these people. Look, it's Eric there. He's a real bad, and I saw him off his face on drink the other day. Him, Look at Jesus is sitting with him. And Jesus hears these mutterings, these remarks, and he tells these parables. So, first of all, the lost sheep. Everybody was familiar with shepherds and sheep. There's plenty of them. They were all over the place. All right? So Jesus often used shepherd sheep metaphors. And he says, suppose you've got a shepherd, he's got 100 sheep, one of them wanders off, he leaves the other 99 safe in the pen, and he goes to find the one that's lost, that's wandering on the hillside, brings it home, throws a party, comes back with his sheep, says, I found the missing sheep, everyone, let's have a party. What we're going to use for the barbecue? Uh, oh, uh, no, no, he didn't say that. <laughs> and then you've got the parable of the lost coin. And it's, kind of, it's the same sort of deal, isn't it? It's the same idea. It's like Jesus repeating himself, but using a different metaphor. There's a woman who's got ten coins, loses one, turns the house upside down, looking for this coin. When she finds it, she throws a party. Now, I'm okay with the parable of the lost sheep, but the parable of the lost coin I struggle with a bit more. I mean, I've got £10 coins in my car, just in case I come across one of your Cornish car parks that won't take my card. I thought I lived in a cashless society in the southeast of England. I did. Came down here, I discover I need cash again. <laughs> okay. And if I lost one, I wouldn't be that bothered, really. If one rolled down under the seat, it'd be fine. 
Can you imagine if you were sat there at home, minding your own business, there's a knock on your door, you open the door, it's one of your neighbours. And she comes in, and she says, come round my house, we're having a party. And you go, what, now? Yeah! Why, what's happened? Well, you'll never guess what I found down the sofa. (laughs) This pound coin! And I'm thinking, I'm just going to call the emergency services now. (laughs) Wouldn't you? You think, how can can a coin be that, you know... I mean, she's got another nine, and presumably they're all identical, aren't they? Years ago, before I was a minister, I was a musician. I've been mentioning it many times. And I used to tour around the UK and abroad doing all these concerts. And I was in North Wales, deep in the valleys. If you're Welsh, apologies for me attempting your accent. Okay? But I was stay- I'd done a concert, and I was staying around at somebody's house. And they had a teenage son. And the teenage son said to me, would you like to see my collection? I says, collection? What, uh, what do you collect? He said, ah, come to my bedroom, I'll show you. So, slightly trepidatiously, uh, I went into his bedroom, and there was his collection of Coke cans. <laughs> Identical Coke cans. He had about 40 of them. They were all arranged on top of his chest of drawers. I said, what do you think of them? <laughs> said, Very nice. <laughs> Is it just Coke cans you collect? Well, no, no. Just diet Coke cans. And I thought, you're mental, mate. <laughs> I didn't say it, obviously, because he was as well, so he'd probably have hammered me into the ground. But thought, there you go. And he's like, what's the big deal? You know? I, I, I look at this parable of the lost coin, and I think, ten identical coins. Unless you're one of these, like, completists... Perhaps they weren't, perhaps they were like commemorative medals. Now, some of you are going to be excluded completely from the next thing I'm going to say, because you're too young. But if you were around in the 70s, not, not the 1870s, the 1970s, I was a kid then, and when my dad used to go to the petrol station and buy petrol, they used to give away all sorts of things. Do you remember those days? You used to get glasses, the amount of glasses we had with Coca-Cola written on, Free glasses with petrol. We had a collection of them for no reason, whatever. But they used to issue commemorative like coins. Do you remember this? Yeah? Of all sorts of things. I can't remember what. I think one of them was like old cars. And they even gave you like a cardboard frame to mount your coins. And he'd get sort of, I don't know, there'd be about 40 of these coins to collect. And he'd get up to about 38 or 39. He'd get really agitated, my dad. He'd be like, I'm going to get some more petrol. You know, you only got some petrol yesterday, dad. Well, to keep it top, top. And just to try and get this missing medal. So I'm thinking perhaps I can identify on that level with, with this woman's joy, having find, found her, her missing coin, you know? Perhaps that's more how it was, the excitement of finding that coin that was lost. Mind you, it might be this, right? So there I am in Jersey, foreign country. Well, not foreign, but Ireland. And anywhere you have to fly to on a plane, you're a little bit more aware, aren't you, of like making sure you've got all your belongings about you because you've got to get back into the UK. And I'm over there in Jersey, and I was out one day, and I put my hand in my coat pocket where my wallet usually was. And it wasn't there. And I'm like, Okay, must be back at the house. Get back to the house, couldn't find it. I'm going round everywhere. I'm checking all my pockets, not there. I checked my bag. It wasn't in the bag where I usually put it. Now, I'm one of these particular slightly OCD people that I always like to put thing, important things like my wallet in the same place. I go into my house, I take my wallet into the study, I always put it in exactly the same place on my desk so I know where it is. And I put my wallet in the bag and it wasn't there. And I started to panic. I said, like, I've lost my wallet. Lost my wa- I'm doing this. Lost my wallet. What are you doing, says Adele? I've lost my wallet. Where is it? Everybody, get looking. Everybody in the house became responsible for finding my wallet. You know, I said, oh, God, he's lost his wallet again. Come on, Dad. You know. I found it. If I, but it's, before I found it, I was worried because obviously it's got your bank card in. And so you're worried about that, aren't you? And then the other thing that was in there was my driving license, which was my photo ID, which meant I wouldn't get back into the UK without it. And then the other thing that was in there was my car park ticket for Exeter Airport, without which I couldn't get out of the car park. So I'm triple panicking. And then I eventually found... Do you know where I found it? I found it in the last place I looked. People always say that, didn't you? 
Where did you... F- no, it was, I'm not even being specific. As they, say, they say, oh, I lost my handbag the other week. You know where I found it? Was it in the last place you looked? It was. How did you know? Well, it's <laughs> always is, isn't it? <laughs> the woman with the lost coin. You imagine her going around to her friends, let's have a party. Where did you find the coin? Do you know it was in the last place? But the feeling of relief when you've got it back. And I think Jesus used that lost coin. He backed up the lost sheep with the lost coin, I think, just to give us an idea of how desperate God feels, how bereft God feels when one of us goes missing, when one of us is not accounted for. He's as desperate as me looking for me wallet, as you searching your handbag for your purse, or whatever it might be. And it's true that God will go out on the... He will leave all of us sat here, because we're safe in the fold, we're the believers, we've put our trust in God, we're here, but he will go out there looking for the lost, for the people of Penzance and surrounding area, who've never heard of Jesus, or if they have... They've heard about it as being a religious club that they don't want to join. And who would? Perhaps there's people out there and, and they've talked to somebody about Jesus at some point. They've heard about Jesus at some point. But unfortunately, it's been done so badly that they've gone, oh, no, I don't think I like the idea of that. Perhaps they've come into a church in Penzance, even this church, and because we don't know them, We haven't bothered speaking to them. It's so easily done, isn't it? It's not what we want. We want to welcome everyone, but sometimes it's like we we naturally gravitate to the people in church that we know. I don't know all of your names yet, but you don't know all of your names. I know that. Sometimes I say to one or or other of you, I say, who's that over there? Because I haven't got to know them yet. And they go, uh, um, uh, don't know. Or sometimes they make up a name. And I subsequently discover that's not that person's name at all. I never go back. I'll never go back to you on that. But we don't know each other that well. But some of us we know really well. That's what about the house group thing. You could go in a house group with a load of random strangers, but you're more, more likely to get on really well with people that you at least have something in common with, whether it's your age demographic or your gender demographic, or whether you work or whether you're retired or whether you're young, whether you're old, whatever. Okay, or your background, whatever. It's inevitable, but there are some people who've come into churches, maybe even this church, nobody has spoken to them, or maybe somebody has spoken to them and they haven't been very friendly, and they've thought, well, blow this. If this is God's chosen people, if this is the church, I'm off. I'll become a pagan. And there's plenty of them around here, I've noticed. People like that, people who've never really had the opportunity, who are out there, lost, wandering, looking for meaning. Everybody's looking for meaning. Post-COVID in particular, loads of people are looking for meaning because their security has been undermined by lockdown, 18 months, two years of lockdown. And they're looking for something. We are in a real time of potential spiritual harvest as people say, well, you know, society let me down, the government let me down. I've lost people, I've known grief. My mental health has suffered, my emotional health has suffered. I need something. Maybe it's Jesus, maybe what if there's something in that? And if they're going to come looking, we need to be ready for them. But God is already out there chasing them down and caring for them and loving them. And as some of you know, sometimes you don't have to go anywhere near a church to encounter Jesus. That's my story. That's my wife's story. We encountered Jesus and then we came to church to find out more about him. That's how it worked for us. And that's how some people will walk through our doors. But they'll be nervous. They may be damaged. It's difficult. But the Lord is out there working on them. And when one of them gets saved, just as when you got saved, a massive party kicks off in heaven. Think of that. When you gave your life to Jesus, all the angels in heaven undid the champagne, turned up the sound system, and partied all night. Except you don't have night in heaven. 
Partied all day. We'd all have day. Just partied. Every time anyone gets saved. If a member of your family or one of your friends gets saved, and if that's happened to you, praise God for that, you know how that makes you feel. It's like there's no greater joy than seeing a member of your family or one of your friends become a Christian. You're like, praise, praise God. This is better than anything. I remember doing, over many years, I've done uh, full immersion baptisms for people. I mean, I don't mind baptizing babies, but I prefer it if we dedicate them and then baptize them when they come to faith. That's how, what it says in the Bible, all right? Okay, I'm not, I'm not against either way, but that's my preference. As a result, I've done a lot of baptisms in the sea. And I remember we were getting some baptisms together and we were going down there and we were baptizing 12 young people in the sea all in one go. And I was trying to get everybody to come down the beach after Christmas, after, Christmas, after church in the morning. I'm saying, come to church with a picnic, let's have church, go down the beach, and we baptize these people. I says, it's better than Christmas. I remember because people quoted it back at me forever. You know, when somebody gets baptized and gives their life to Jesus, it's better than Christmas. Thank you, sister. Well, it is though, isn't it? Yeah. If you are going to come to the Covenant service next week, uh, next Sunday afternoon, 2.30 at High Street, and there's these five people, they're not giving their lives to Jesus, they've already done that, but they are saying, I'm a Christian, and because I'm a Christian, I know the Lord wants me to serve him somewhere in a church, and this is the one that he's given me, so I'm going to commit to this church. That's what membership is. And I'm praising God for that as well. I mean, I thought our carol service was really epic, but that's going to be up there with that, watching those people give their lives, you know, give their their commitment to the church uh, in the name of Jesus. Fantastic. There's really one thing more to say on this. And as I say, first, so there's the Pharisees going, Jesus mixes with anybody. And Jesus says, yeah, I do mix with anybody. And the people who won't come to me, I'll go to them. I'll go out and I'll find them and I'll carry them home because I want everyone to be safe. Scripture tells us this. It says that God has a desire that all people should be saved. Everyone. Everyone. Also, we are told in Isaiah 53, verse 6, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Everyone to his own way. Before we found Jesus, we were out there wandering on the hillside, lost. And the Lord himself goes out to gather us home. Jesus said, I'm just making sure I get the reference right before I'm looking down, Matthew 9, verse 36. It said that Jesus looked at the people who were following him, that he was ministering to and healing. He looked at them, and it said he had compassion on them. His heart was moved for them. It says because they were harassed and helpless. Harassed, they were troubled, they were anxious, they were burdened, and they were helpless. They couldn't do anything to save themselves. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. He tells us so himself. John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. If you know me, if you give your life to me, says Jesus, if you become a Christian, then you listen out for my voice. You learn to recognize my voice when I'm talking to you. And you have the confidence to follow me. And so I can lead you out from the church, from the sheep pen. I can lead you out into the community, into the workplace, into the neighborhood. Jesus, this is. And you will have the confidence to be who you are, full of light, full of the Holy Spirit in whatever circumstance. And not, not sort of, not embarrassed about your faith. If somebody says to you, you go to church, don't you, at Chapel Street? And it's really easy to sort of get embarrassed about it and go, well, you know, now and again I might do. And then they go, well, they're obviously not very committed. I don't think I'll bother going with them. Jesus said, don't worry about what you have to say in that situation. The Holy Spirit will speak in your heart. Just be ready. Be listening. Jesus will call us. He is calling us to follow, to go on a journey with him. It's starting our journey in a couple of weeks when our theme preaching starts. Be there with it. Get involved. It won't hurt you. There's no reason to be at all anxious or trepidatious. It's just going to be fun. It's going to be brilliant. But remember that after the parable of the sheep, after the parable of the coin, where we learn how valuable we are to God, whether we're saved or not, there's the parable of the prodigal son. And this is where sometimes we get it wrong. Because you see, if you're not a Christian, if you've never heard about Jesus, you're out there wandering on the hillside, you're lost, you're directionless, you're like sheep without a shepherd, and God will come out looking for you. But if you are a believer, 
if you are a Christian, if you have given your life to the Lord, and then in 2022, you say to yourself, yeah, I can't be bothered with this anymore, and you disappear from our fellowship, and you disappear from God, he will not come looking for you. And when I say that, people go, I don't think you're right there, Ralph. No, seriously, in the parable of the prodigal son, the son, the heir, comes to his father and says, Father, give me my inheritance. And the father, because he loves his son, says, okay, son, I don't think you should have it. I think this is, this is going to end badly. Yeah, but I want it, Dad. Okay, because I love you, I'm going to give you it. And off he goes, and he squanders it. We know the story. Does his dad go after him? No. But out of love, he lets him go. Because if you love someone, you let them free. You set them free. If you've got kids, if you've had kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because at certain points in their life, notably their teenage years, I've found, they start saying, they start pushing the boundaries, and they start saying, oh, I'm off to do this, I'm off to do that. They don't come home one night, stuff like that. What do you do? You could lock them in their room, some parents do, but that's not parenthood, is it? You, you love them so much that you don't want to imprison them, you don't want to tie them down, so you kind of let them go, and you warn them, and you say, I don't think this is good, but you're going to let them go, and they do go, and they make their own mistakes. We made our own mistakes, didn't we? We didn't always listen to our parents. Some of our parents weren't great. My parents were great, as it goes. But the Lord will let you go. If you say, I don't want this anymore, the Lord will say, okay, I still love you, but where you go, you're free to go. And the prodigal son ends up in the pigsty. Did his dad come looking for him in the city? Did he do a a tour of the pigsties? No. He stayed back at home. But he was always there for the time that his son came back. For those of us that we have lost from this fellowship. The Lord has let them go. But whenever they want to return, he's waiting with his arms open. And I mean that. The prodigal son came back and he thought his dad had treated him as a slave at best. And his dad welcomed him back, slew the calf, had a barbecue, party started. Because the one who was lost, who shouldn't have been lost, had come home. Some people think that the parable of the lost sheep is about believers going astray. It's not. It's about people who aren't believers. The parable of the prodigal son, that's about believers who go astray. It's no accident that Luke has put these two parables so close together. And it's important we understand the distinction between them. If any of us are struggling with our faith... We need to help one another and support one another. But ultimately, if we want to go, we're free to go. I know that some people, COVID has been kind of an excuse to let go of church. And there are people missing from in this room this morning. And we should be praying for them, that they might return. But they can't return on their own terms. They have to return on the Lord's terms, because it's the Lord that we serve. And there are those who are yet to join us. And my attention is firmly fixed on the mission field because that's where Jesus tells us to focus our attention. That we might witness to all people, regardless of who they are, where they're from, that we might build a community of faith. And let me tell you one final thing. If we are worshipping as we should, if we are praying as we should, if we are regular in our fellowship, as we should be, then the evangelism that we need to do is actually quite minimal because the Lord will honour and bless what we are doing in his name and people will come. Simple as that. Right, now this is a lot to take in and as we do, I'm going to invite the band back forward. We're going to share in a song together called Mighty to Save. You ready, guys? We're going to sing together and worship the Lord and then we're going to break bread together.